Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. I hope you're having a great day today, and I'm really excited for our show. We're going to be talking to an herbalist today. But before we get to that, I just have a couple of announcements. Um, one is we are looking for sponsorships for the podcast. So if you have a friend or if you yourself have a great product that promotes healing, well being, wellness, supports the whole evolution of consciousness, we would love to hear from you. You can email me at April at path11productions.com and I will send you over the details on what it takes to become a sponsor for our show. If we feel that your product, your book, uh, whatever it is that you might be selling is in line with our mission, then that is going to rank you even higher in priority to become a sponsor. Um, So we're looking for that, and we also created a page on Patreon. I had never heard of this before. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of what Patreon is. If you're not, you can go to path11podcast.com, and on the right-hand side of the page, there is an orange button. You can go ahead and click that, and it brings you to our Patreon page. So this is basically another way that you can help support the podcast, and it's basically donating money to us, and if you donate certain amounts, we give back and you get some cool rewards. So the first tier is a dollar per month. That's it. Just a buck. Less than a cup of coffee. That's just telling us, hey, you're doing a great job. We love you. Love the podcast. Keep the episodes coming. And uh, there's really no reward for that other than a nice thank you from me. And if there's any way for us to get your name, I'll give you a shout out. How about that? Um, The next level tier is to do $3 a month and you become a meditation supporter. What I've done is I have recorded a guided meditation that you will receive. And it's an induction meditation that helps to relax your body from the top of your head down to your toes and helps you to set an intention for your day. Again, that's $3 a month. Then to be a DVD supporter, that would be $5 a month. We have 100 DVDs remaining of the Path Evolution, and you will get one mailed to you if you become that supporter. And the next donation is $10 a month. You become the book supporter. Anyone who is a fan of William Buhlman will get the book Adventures Beyond the Body. And that's a great book if you haven't already read it. But we only have 20 of those in stock. So that will be a limited supply. Once those are gone, we will replace it with another nice gift. And then the trilogy supporter. That is $25 a month. We have 20 trilogy sets of all three of our films that you will get as a thank you for being a supporter for that month. It's also my understanding that with Patreon, you can become a one-time supporter. So you can do $1 once, and then if you no longer want to support us, you have the option to opt out. You can get the trilogy for $25 and help support the podcast that way. So there's really no obligation to continue, but of course, we would love it if you would like to. So... Those are all of my announcements, and now let's get on with the show. Okay, so today I am joined with Holly Bellabono, who is an American herbalist, speaker, author, and empowerment facilitator, specializing in women's health and visionary thinking. She is the CEO of Bella Bono Holistic International, the operating entity for the Bella Bono School of Herbal Medicine, Vineyard Herb Teas, <laughs> Apothecary and her renowned publishing and speaking activities. As an herbalist of several decades, Holly has authored numerous award winning books on herbal medicine and empowerment. She is a sought after speaker and teacher at conference and universities, and she welcomes you to study and work with her from your own home at her on site training program on Martha's Vineyard and at her events across the U.S. and abroad. And today we're going to be speaking with Holly about her book, An Herbalist Guide to Formulary, The Art and Science of Creating Effective Herbal Remedies. Welcome, Holly. Thank you, April. Very nice to be here. Yeah, I'm kind of excited to talk about um, plants and herbs. Uh, We really have never had anyone on the podcast yet to talk about this. And, um, you know, I have a personal invested interest in it. I really started getting into more natural, holistic remedies a few years ago and um, always trying to find different formulas and things to use outside of antibiotics. Um, There's a you know, period of time I wasn't covered with health insurance. So I was really trying to keep my immune system and, you know, body all together. So I wouldn't have to go to the doctors and have an, uh, you know, an enormous uh, medical bill. So I'm really excited to talk about this today. I was wondering if you can give our listeners just a brief introduction about how you got into 
um, herbalism. Yeah, definitely. So there are so many wonderful herbalists out there who grew up with herbs. They grew up at the knee of their grandmother who was teaching them about plants or something. And my background is completely different. I grew up the daughter of a pharmacist and a registered nurse. And so it was a very mainstream medical household. We went to the doctor for any illness. Um, and we went to the grocery store for all of our food. Uh, knew nothing about foraging or really even gardening. My mother tried gardening a little bit, but really it was very mainstream. And it wasn't until, um, I had always been interested in plants and mother nature, but was um, not really encouraged to pursue it until I was in graduate school in at uh, Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina in the mountains. And I got a part-time job on a landscaping crew to help pay my way through school. And the director of the landscaping crew was this old hippie who was really wonderful and didn't, it wasn't just your typical day-to-day heaving rock kind of landscape crew. He was really interested in philosophy and in uh, intuition and teaching us how to listen to plants. And from him, I learned, A, that some plants are edible, wild plants that you can just go out in your backyard and eat some of the things that are growing out there, which was novel to me. I'd never heard that before. And then B, that some plants were medicinal. And that really opened up a whole um, world to me of healing and medicine, completely different from the mainstream pharmaceuticals that I had grown up with. And so I endeavored to learn everything I could about edible and especially medicinal plants. And um, living in the mountains, in the Appalachian Mountains, it's so rich and fertile, and there's so much biodiversity there. It was an incredible place to learn about plants and just discovered hundreds and hundreds of plants and have since... um, you know, written books about them and my experiences with them. And I've opened up an herbal medic, excuse me, an herbal medicine school that's been going for about seven years now. And I've had apprentices and mentors and lots of students. And it's really fun sometimes to introduce people to plants who like me don't really have much of a connection or a history with them. And other times I'm working with people who are very um, involved not only with plants, but also with health and their healing arts practitioners and their healthcare professionals. And they want to integrate herbal medicine into their current practice. So I, I work with people all across the board and it's a real joy to share, um, medicinal herbs with everyone. Yeah, that's great. And I'd like to talk more about, um, plant consciousness if we can. I know I subscribe to a newsletter about it. I I stumbled upon it. There's like a conference about it. I'm fascinated by some of, you know, the research about that. Um, you know, anytime anybody ever goes out in nature, when I go hiking, I could just feel the energy from the trees. I feel alive. The air feels so good around, you know, plants and trees and things of that sort. So can you talk a little bit about consciousness and plants? Yeah, definitely. It's um, for me personally. I think I, I feel like I strike a per, a pretty good balance between the pharmacology side and the science side of herbal medicine because I really enjoy that. I really enjoy the chemistry and the actions and the pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals and the uh, anatomy physiology kind of science aspect of herbal medicine. But I also really appreciate the intuition and the personal connection that you can get with plants. Plants and trees, like you said, especially Um, growing up in North Carolina in the mountains, I was definitely a child of nature and totally felt the energies of the forests around me. And the forests in Appalachian, in Western North Carolina, are stunning and breathtaking. And to feel that kind of power and energy around you is really empowering to you and can lead you in a direction that you might not have followed. And herbalism is interesting because we admire the plants, we love the plants, we feel a very deep personal connection spiritually to the plants. But when you you become an herbalist, you're also using the plants for health. And so that brings in the science part of it. And so it really is a lovely balance, I think, of the intuition and the science, the spirituality and the mechanics. Um, It's a great blend and it is really a wonderful learning opportunity, partly for the science if you're new to that. And it's also a growth opportunity in the spiritual end of it because you really do get to recognize each plant as its own unique energy. It's almost like coming across a friend. You know, when you go in your garden and you see the calendula and the thyme and the hyssop and the yarrow, you recognize them as individuals, um, 
part of a family and they have their own unique characteristics in their personalities, and it can be very uh, enlightening and fun at the same time and very meaningful. It brings in a, a depth to the experience of herbalism that you might not get otherwise. Yeah, and it's interesting that you grew up, you know, with uh, a parent being um, a pharmacist, <laughs> you know, and more in the pharmaceuticals, because it does seem like that, you know, I feel I'm seeing more of a trend of people coming back to herbs and natural medicine in the ways that we used to treat the body, as opposed to more of the westernized medicine and pills. Um, so how, how exactly, maybe you can take us through a little bit more of the history of how plants have been used for medicinal purposes. Oh, wow. It's a huge history uh, from cultures all over the world. For thousands of years, plants have been a key cornerstone to people's health. Um, it's people's pharmacy. It's folk medicine. Plants are easy to find. They're easy to observe, uh, easy to grow. And then when you apply them to your body, usually you can see actions and activity very quickly. Um, and so you can tell if something is healing or if it's counterproductive. Uh, so people all over the world have used plants um, in many, many different ways. There's traditional Chinese medicine, there's Ayurveda, there's Native American medicine, there's Western herbalism. Um, Western herbalism is the, the foundation that I'm most familiar with. Um, but I pull from other cultures and traditions too, especially Ayurveda. Um, and I really appreciate how different cultures approach their knowledge and their learning of plants. Some of them are very scientific, like we talked about. Some of them are very intuitive and spiritual based. Um, it's just such a, a, an incredible journey to discover how people have used plants over the years. My own, my own practice and my own study of medicine is, um, it began with listening, experimenting and listening really is what I would say. Experimenting by tasting plants, um, following around old timers in the mountains uh, of Appalachia where I lived who would let me, for instance, there's uh, especially this one woman who lived in Sugar Grove, North Carolina, lovely valley. And she was a Scottish um, Highland descendant. And she would go out in the mountains every day and pick the herbs that she wanted for her meals uh, and also for her medicine. And she allowed me to just tail along and tag behind her. And she taught me a lot of the local native plants and how to use them. Um, and, uh, so experimenting and asking questions and tasting and harvesting, um, and then growing as a gardener, I became a gardener. So those were key ways for me to learn. And then, um, more of the science came behind it, uh, reading, uh, learning about the chemistry, learning about um, clinical trials that are being done, and really pairing those. So the intuition and the folk medicine with the science, um, it really is a, a lovely blend, and it makes it very effective, I think. Um, so there's a lot of different ways, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of different ways people can come into herbal medicine. And I guess I just like to emphasize that you don't have to grow up on a farm and you don't have to have grown up with um, a witchy grandmother who's wonderful, who shows you everything from the age five. Um, you can enter wherever you are and begin learning about herbs in a way that is familiar and comfortable for you. <clears throat> for instance, um, I know people who really want to learn about herbs through gardening. And so what's comfortable for them is to plant some sage and grow it and experiment with it and use it that way. I know other people who don't have a green thumb at all, but really want to get into plant medicine. And for instance, taking a bath, they want to take a bath. What a wonderful way to bring plants into your life. You boil water, you put plants in the water, you pour it into your tub, and you literally infuse yourself with the energy of that plant. And both of those are wonderful ways to become herbal minded and start your journey with, um, botanical therapy. Yeah. And you mentioned about, um, that you practice a little bit more of Western herbalism. Can you talk about that and kind of what's the difference and how is that made up? Sure. So, um, uh, for instance, um, traditional Chinese medicine, uh, it focuses on oriental plants, obviously. Um, but it also incorporates, uh, animal parts and minerals and crystals into different formulas. And they tend to use a lot of plants and a lot of ingredients for one remedy. And it's called polypharmacy. Um, Ayurveda is a different type of tradition where 
they uh, incorporate different life um, events or lifestyles, including um, how you talk to people, how you um, how you exercise, what foods you eat, and they include herbalism as part of that. Um, it's just a different way of looking at healing. Native American uh, traditions are much more spiritual. Um, it's listening to the energies around you and incorporating uh, the wisdom that you're taught through uh, intuition, incorporating that into your medicine. Western herbal medicine is a little bit different in that it is focused on North American plants primarily. Um, we deal a lot with extracts. So a, a lot of the way that we incorporate plants into our medicine is to extract the qualities from them into a liquid, usually. Now, you can dry herbs and make capsules, or you can dry them and make powders, but a lot of times Western herbalists will use what's called a menstruum or a liquid to extract the properties from a plant. And that's one of the things I like to teach people is that there are so many different ways to do it, so many different liquids you can use. Water, obviously, is the easiest and the safest, and we can make a tea. And most people are very familiar with teas, and that's a lovely way to start learning about a particular plant and how it tastes and how it acts in your body. Um, but there are other liquids that you can use. You can use milk. Uh, so for children who can't sleep, um, infusing chamomile or lavender into some milk uh, on the stovetop and bringing it to a simmer and then straining the herbs out and letting the child drink that, that's a medicine. It's herbal medicine. And it's not something a lot of people think of very often, but it's very effective and very lovely. And it's a really nice way to introduce yourself and especially your kids to the beauty of plants. Um, other liquids that you can use are vinegar, apple cider vinegar. Um, you can use honey, infuse herbs in all of these things. Uh, witch hazel for topical liniments, really nice for sore muscles and sore joints. Um, all the way up to grain alcohol, we're all familiar now with seeing those little brown bottles in the health food store that are uh, tinctures. And a tincture is a wonderful method. It's a good strategy for using herbs, especially for acute conditions, but it's not the only way. And if you're avoiding alcohol or if you aren't quite comfortable yet making a tincture, I encourage people to experiment with what you've got around your kitchen, honey, vinegar, milk, water, really lovely ways to make herbal medicine and to introduce yourself to plants and do something really effective at the same time. So that's that's one of the um, strengths, I think, of Western herbal medicine. Um, and it's a, it's a philosophy that has grown, I would say, mostly since the 70s, since the 60s and 70s, when pioneers like Rosemary Gladstar were out in the woods learning about plants because it was kind of an underground thing. Once antibiotics and the scientific revolution took over and herbal medicine wasn't quite as common or traditional as it used to be, finally in the 60s and 70s, people started saying, hey, we want this knowledge back. And uh, it's grown into what it is today, which is a very inclusive, I think, and very welcoming tradition. Um, and it's also one of the few traditions that I'm aware of that really emphasizes conserving and preserving medicinal plants in the wild. And speaking of Rosemary Gladstar, she created uh, United Plant Savers. So it's a nonprofit organization that educates people about preserving these medicinal plants so that they don't go extinct. Um, because the boom in this uh, industry has gotten to the point where a lot of the plants that we think of as, oh, we just take golden seal when we get sick, it's just what you do. Actually, golden seal is threatened. So, so as part of the Western uh, herbal tradition, I think conservation and preservation and education is really a wonderful aspect of that tradition. And I'm, I'm happy that that's part of it now. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that and was wondering of that myself. So you, you already answered a question that was in my mind. Um, yeah, and just and also respect for nature and making sure that we're replenishing and sustaining, you know, the resources that we are using. Um, but I can imagine, you know, some extinction of certain plants if, if they're overused or if it's not being respected. Um, before yeah, we get... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, go just, ahead. I was just going to add to that. It's interesting. It's It's a big debate actually in the herbal world um, when you're dealing with plants that are threatened like osha or um, uh, echinacea or golden seal or arnica 
um, some of these species are really not thriving very well. Um, but they're so medicinal and they're so useful. So finding that balance, figuring out, well, do we keep using it as a medicine and do we keep allowing people to harvest them and make remedies with them? Or do we put that plant completely off limits, risking losing the knowledge of that in another generation or two? So it's this fine line that do you want to keep it active as a medicine or to save it altogether so it continues to live? Do you want to put it away and um, risk deleting that from the entire tradition? So it's an interesting thought. Yeah, and kind of to piggyback off of that, and this is just kind of a random question that just came to my mind while you were saying that, say with golden seal and echinacea, how how does somebody say like myself, um, just kind of getting into this and I want to start using these supplements, how do we know what the real ones are? What do we look for as opposed to, you know, going into a Walmart and getting, I don't know what their brand is, Simple Made or something, echinacea, as opposed to going to a natural food store and, you know, their echinacea might be 10 times the cost, but that it might be the real deal. How, how do we know what to choose? What are we looking for? Yeah, I would advise that instead of going to a big box store first, that you seek out your local herbalist. Uh, there are a lot of really knowledgeable, um, talented herbalists in this country who have trained um, in various different ways and have studied me uh, herbal medicine for a long time and have built their careers on creating authentic, um, sustain sustainably produced medicines. And I think if you can seek out your local herbalist, definitely support him or her. That would be the first way to go. Um, and if you can't access someone locally who has that kind of knowledge, um, then health food stores are generally a little bit better than the big box stores, partly because they have um, access to um, the bigger herb farms like Gaia or um, herb farm that uh, really do work hard to have the actual product you're looking for. If they say it's the herb it is, it is. There's no irradiation. They tend to produce organically, that sort of thing. Um, and they also have fresher products. Someone like um, Walmart or those big box stores, while they might have a, a bottle of capsules of dried whatever, it could have been sitting in their warehouse for four years, and it might not be potent anymore. It might not do you any good to even take it. Um, so definitely shop local first. Think about your um, – from working from the ground up, really. Think about the small uh, small folks, <laughs> the herbalists who are making this their life's work, and support them, and you'll be supporting yourself at the same time. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. I didn't even think to like search online for a local herbalist to see. Um, so I'll definitely do that. Um, and then I have kind of one more, uh, one or two more questions and I'd like to get into your book, but I had a friend recently who um, went through some sort of herbalist training. I don't remember where, but uh, she was telling me some stories about how her teacher, as she would introduce them into the plants and the different herbs, they would do it through tea. And they would also go on a spiritual journey with the tea. And uh, this one friend of mine, they the teacher wouldn't really tell them like what to expect because she wanted them to experience Um experience the plant for itself. And, uh, my friend, they did a journey with ginkgo and it actually helped to unlock a suppressed memory from the past. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you're familiar at all with anything like that. I am. I don't teach it myself. It's not part of my, um, training and, and what I offer to other people, but I have experienced it from other teachers in the past. And it was really wonderful for me to, um, be part of these groups, you know, two dozen years ago when I was beginning on my herbal journey to look at it from a very spiritual perspective and, uh, an energy perspective. Um, because I think really the, the core of herbal medicine is connection. And if you can connect with a plant, um, whether it's through taste or that you like to grow it, or it's a shamanic journey sort of experience, um, whatever your connection is, that is what is going to make that plant meaningful for you and help you care not only about the plant, but about uh, your health and about the environment and stewarding. Um, and so those sorts of journeys, those sorts of experiences, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's in a group or whether it's a private experience that you have on your own, I think those are very meaningful and enlightening. And each of us comes to this journey in a different way. 
Um, so I, I just think that's wonderful. Yeah. And, um, I know sometimes our listeners like it when I share some personal stories. Um, so I'd like to share one of a plant that I have been using and maybe we can begin to go into your book this way too. Um, I've been trying, I've been learning more about Ayurvedic medicine and also trying to treat some heartburn and indigestion more naturally than taking a Miprazole that was given by my primary care physician. So through my research, uh, one of the things that I found was the aloe vera plant an aloe vera juice or aloe vera extract. I'm not exactly sure. I don't have the bottle in front of me, but how that can be used to really help to coat the stomach and the esophagus. And I was using it for about a week, went through a whole bottle of it and didn't need to take any, you know, heartburn medicine and found that I had tremendous results just in making that one change. So I, I was wondering if you have any knowledge of the aloe plant, because my only introduction to it would be my grandmother would have it on her stove, and anytime we would burn ourselves from yeah. cooking, she'd take the plant and put it on our burn. But I had no idea that this was something that you could drink and that was beneficial for the body. So um, do you have any knowledge about the aloe vera plant? Yeah, so the aloe plant is beautiful, and it's a wonderful desert plant. It grows huge out in the desert, and here in my house, you know, our little potted plants are much smaller, but really a wonderful plant. And it's interesting that you mention using it both internally and topically for burns because it has both those actions. When you use it topically uh, as a soothing, cooling agent on the skin, it's called an emollient. But that same soothing, cooling action when you take it internally is demulcent. So those are two different words um, that are action-oriented that show us that this plant has um, has a lot of versatility to it. It can be useful in multiple situations. And when you're when you're thinking about building a formula, talking about my book, uh, Herbalist Guide to Formulary, thinking about actions like that is really a smart way to go. So knowing that aloe vera is emollient and demulcent can help you figure out where to put it in a formula to make an effective remedy for somebody, whether they are whether they have a burn or whether they're dealing with something like you mentioned, like heart, heartburn or gastric reflux or peptic ulcers, something hot and inflamed internally. So that's a um, that's a nice uh, segue into the book, actually, because uh, actions of the plants are really helpful. That's a good way to get started. Yeah, and and in your book, I mean, you have you've broke it down really nicely. Um, you know. One of the sections is on the core body systems, which is all about um, digestion, cardiovascular, respiratory. Then you have um, chapters about the brain and the nervous system, memory and thought, the immune system in another section, hormones and the endocrine system in another. And um, I thought what might be nice is to talk a little bit about the belly and digestion, because I know that there's a lot more research out there talking about how, you know, the stomach is kind of the first mind and, you know, what they're finding about the intelligence, um, you know, of the stomach. And so many people are struggling with digestion issues and problems. And you have quite a few um, remedies here in the book to help with those different issues. Yeah, digestion is huge. I ran an apothecary for years and years, about 11 years, and one of the biggest um, complaints that I got from people was poor digestion. It's an, it's an enormous issue, and we all experience um, gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea. Um, it's very common. Um, a lot of us experience even worse symptoms uh, and issues such as Crohn's disease, um, allergic reactions. Um, gastroenteritis, ulcers, um, so many things with the digestion. It's a very complex um, organ or system of the body, and it's even harder to deal with because when you eat foods, as we do every day, <laughs> um, they can either make things better or worse. So, um, so yeah, when you're talking about herbs for digestion, uh, as I mentioned a minute ago, thinking about the actions of herbs can be very helpful. For instance, there are herbs that are carminative, and carminative is an action, and it just means herbs are aromatic, and they stimulate um, gallbladder production and bile production, and they help um, peristalsis, and they help the digestion system work. So carminative herbs are things that are usually aromatic. So we've got lemon balm, chamomile, ginger, <clears throat> fennel, dill, all of the mints, peppermint, especially spearmint. So any of these are good places to start when you have digestive issues. 
um, taking a carminative herb as a tea or adding it to your food, any of these, many of these herbs, you can take a leaf and, and put the leaves in your salad and just chew them and experience the aromatherapy of it. And they can be very beneficial to digestive issues. When you're also putting together herbs that you want to use for your digestion, whatever your symptom or issue might be. So in addition to carminative herbs, you can think of other actions. For instance, if you're very gassy, perhaps uh, antispasmodic would be very helpful because a lot of the spasms can cause pain and it makes it embarrassing. And um, it's not something you want to go out in public if you're constantly um, having gas or, or um, diarrhea. Uh, for children, especially, they you know you eat something wrong or stress can add to uh, a, a bad day and it can create diarrhea for a child. Um, and so an antispasmodic would be an action that would be very useful. And so antispasmodics include peppermint, <clears throat> spearmint, ginger, uh, wild yam. And so if you notice, uh, spearmint and ginger were also carminative. So those are what I, what I like to call overlap herbs. They have more than one action, meaning if you make a list and you see that those herbs appear in both lists, that might be a very good herb for you. Um, and then I also like to include a tonic. Uh, and tonic herbs are very nourishing and very nutritive. They're kind of food-like, and they often support the nervous system. They help us relax. They help us feel good. They help us adapt to stress a little bit. Um, while giving us the vitamins and minerals that we need because of their nutrient um, uh, capacity. Um, and so a tonic herb for indigestion might be something like oats or stinging nettles. Um, and so adding, combining all these in a remedy in one formula can be a really effective way to go. And they're very easy and safe herbs, mostly food like ginger, most of us have ginger in our kitchen. We have oats in our kitchen. So these are uh, really easy ways to get started in supporting your own health and maintaining your own sense of um, confidence with herbal medicine, uh, self-sustaining, uh, you know, relying on your own self in your own kitchen rather than going to a pharmacy or a doctor for a medicine that may or may not work or may have side effects. Great. Thank you. And, you know, as I'm going through your book, too, and somebody being very new at this, I mean, there are some some herbs in here that I've never heard of, <laughs> like oat straw. I've never heard of that. Linden. I've never heard of that. Um, Mother Ward, I have heard of before. Yeah, I bet. So oat straw is the stalk of the oat grain. So if you've ever had oatmeal, that's the grain from the oat plant. And uh, all parts of the plant, including the stalk, are medicinal. So that's very common. And then uh, linden is actually a, a tilia tree, basswood, and we see that as an ornamental tree in a lot of public parks. So um, if you uh, happen to go to a park that ha is lined with very beautiful trees with uh, scalloped leaves, it could be a linden tree. So they're very common. It's nice to get to know things that are all around you. And you're like, oh, hey, I know that, you know, and it turns out that's medicinal. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's like a whole nother world all in itself. Just looking through some of these formulas that you have, I, you know, I would be like going into a store or going to an herbalist and being like, do you have X, Y, and Z, <laughs> you know, cause it, it's, it's all new, all new to me. Um, yeah. And another one was cramp bark. I have never heard of that before either. What is that? Yeah. Cramp bark is a viburnum, which is a genus of shrubs. Um, they're pretty common all over the West Coast. Um, both cramp bark and black haw are related. And they're the kind of greenery that's in the background that you just don't notice when you're on a walk in the woods. But um, it turns out that the root of those shrubs are um, antispasmodic and they will help reduce cramps, both in the stomach and in the uh, uterus. So they're um, traditionally used as remedies. And uh, once you see them and you go for a walk in the woods, you'll always see them. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I also wanted to ask you some questions too. So with your formulas, I just kind of opened up the book randomly and I went to pre and post stroke and heart attack formulas. Mm -hmm. So all of your formulas are very similar in this, but, um, let's see a formula preventive heart care. You have two parts, linden flour, one part oat straw or oats, milky tops, one part spearmint, one part rose hips. So 
how do I blend that? What's one part? What does two parts mean? How do we know if we're using enough? Are these like pinches? Are we breaking stuff off? Uh, how, what, how are you measuring this just so we know what we're putting into this yeah. if we're going to make a tea? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So this book kind of follows on an earlier book I wrote called The Essential Herbal for Natural Health. And in that earlier book, I got into how to make the medicines themselves, how to make a syrup, how to make a tincture, how to brew a tea, how to make a liniment, how to make a salve or an ointment, and um, all of the different recipes and step-by-step uh, methods from handcrafting these at home. And I also went into dosage guidelines and what a dose means and how to figure out what the correct um, parameters are. So that book was more addressing what the current question that you're asking. Okay. Yep. Because that's what I was thinking too. I'm like, what are the tools? How do I crush these up? What if I want to make them, you know, into capsules? And I'm thinking, where do I go and buy this stuff? And, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Yes. And that, that book again was the essential herbal for natural okay. health. Yep. The essential herbal for natural health. And it was published okay. by Shambhala. Um, and so that was a real how to hands-on guide. Whereas this one, the herbalist guide to formulary is a little bit more theoretical. It's, um, not necessarily assuming that you already know how to do all that stuff, but it is um, more anatomy and physiology and showing what the herbs do in the body and a little bit more, um, you know, illness and symptom based so that if you have a certain issue, you can look it up in the book and see, oh, okay, these herbs would help, even though it doesn't tell you exactly how to make a remedy with those herbs. Um, but to answer your question, so the parts, the formulas are, um, two parts this herb, one part that herb, a half part of this herb. And what that means is, say you're making a tea, you want to start with dried herbs, and a dose is usually one teaspoon dried herb per cup of water. And so that one teaspoon might be a part. So if you see two parts in a formula, you want to put two teaspoons in, so you get more of that herb. Um, and then you would uh, increase the water. So for every teaspoon, you get a cup of water. So you would make it in, say, a quart canning jar, put your herbs in, pour your water in, let it sit for anywhere from 8 to 15 minutes, strain it out, and then that's your medicine, and you drink three to four cups daily. So that's your quart jar. And if you do that every day, then that's how you're getting your medicine. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, now, I wonder and people might be having this question too, what plants are poisonous that we should not be ingesting? Are there such thing as poisonous plants that would be fatal? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, there are plants that you definitely want to avoid. Um, and some of them are more poisonous than others. But for instance, if you're a newbie to herbal medicine and you want to uh, experiment, there are some herbs that you probably shouldn't experiment with first. Poke root is one. Uh, the berries can be toxic. Um, Jamaican dogwood is a wonderful medicine, and it's not a poisonous plant, but it is very strong. Uh, so that's not one for a beginner. Um, Paldarco is another wonderful medicinal tree from South America, and it's a, a fantastic, safe tree, but it is strong. So it's another one that if you're new or if you're working with children, that would be one to avoid. What I generally tell people is start with what's in your kitchen. We have so many safe herbs already in our kitchen. We have thyme, oregano, dill, fennel, lavender, chamomile, um, ginger, garlic, uh, these are all super safe herbs. They're known to be safe and they're generally abundant. They're easy to come across, easy to find. Um, those are the best places to start. If you're new, um, go to town on the herbs in your kitchen. There's so much fun to play with. And if you can come up with a dozen herbs that are in your kitchen cabinet or that you could purchase knowing that they're for the kitchen, um, then you pretty much have nothing to worry about. Mint, ginger, um, turmeric now, cinnamon. Cinnamon is an excellent, excellent medicine for so many different things. It's bitter, it's aromatic, it's carminative, um, it's stimulant, it's vasodilatory, um, sometimes antispasmodic. We're finding that it's really good for neurodegenerative diseases. So people who want to improve their mental health and mental clarity, get rid of that mental fog, add a little cinnamon to your oatmeal every day, include it in your honeys. Um, you can make uh, different remedies with honey and cinnamon really safe, really good ways to go with um, your kitchen remedy. So if you're new and you're wanting to experiment, that is such a fun way to go and you won't be disappointed. 
Right. Yeah. The, the newest herb that my acupuncturist recommended was fennel. Mm -hmm. Fennel. Yeah. I think it was fennel where you can, um, you can toast them and put them in tea and water and kind of tastes very similar to licorice. Yes, it has an oil in it called anethol. And uh, that gives it its characteristic fennel flavor. And the seeds, what you're saying, you can toast the seeds and use them. You can use the fronds if you grow it. Just pick the leaves. Um, and you can eat the root. It's a vegetable. So it's a great herb. Yeah. And it's been in my spice rack forever. Never <laughs> used it. Don't cook it. You know, I, I don't cook with it. I never really knew, you know, how to use it, I guess. And now I'm putting it in tea. And it's uh, it's really neat. It, it, you're right. It's a lot of fun to play with the herbs that you already have in your kitchen. Yeah. Um, Let's see, maybe two more questions. Um, I know that, you know, one of the diseases that plagues so many Americans is cancer. And people are going through radiation and chemo treatment. Do you have any specific herbs that you would recommend somebody that is going through treatment or trying to bring the body back into alignment um, and counteracting cancer cells? Are there any herbs that you would say scientifically are known to work really well for the body? So that's a good question. Um, I personally don't do a lot of cancer research with herbal medicines myself, and it's not something that I include in my herb school. Um, cancer and diabetes, uh, they're very complex topics, and I don't go there pretty much. But there are herbs that are being studied as um, neoplastic or anti-tumor herbs. Uh, there are a lot of them, actually, and it's very exciting to get to learn about them. Um, when I work with my herbal students, I generally tell them, if you're working with someone with cancer and you want to support them herbally, um, it can be helpful to consider herbs an adjunct or a corollary support to whatever treatment they're already getting, keeping in mind that they might be on a lot of different pharmaceuticals, um, which means that some of our tonic herbs are the most helpful. Uh, so if you're not an expert in herbal medicine and you don't know what the latest research in anti-tumor herbs is, I think it's safest to go with um, tonic herbs. So for instance, oats. Oats is a very um, uh, vessel strengthening plant. It's a nervous system strengthening plant and it's high in minerals. And it doesn't react really with many medications. There aren't many contraindications for oats. So that's a pretty safe one to work with someone who has cancer and might be undergoing chemo or radiation. Another one is stinging nettles. And stinging nettles is a great vegetable. It's a food, it's a medicine all in one. And that one can be very nourishing and supporting for someone who has cancer, although it is high in vitamin K. So if you're working with somebody who is taking uh, blood thinners or is um, on a whole lot of medications, they might need to avoid um, green veggie plants. And so stinging nettles might not work for that person. But in general, the tonics are a really good way to go. Um, chamomile can be very soothing to someone who is, who is anxious and uh, stressed out about their cancer. Um, and uh, if they don't have hay fever and can take chamomile, that can be a lovely way, either drinking it as a tea or pouring it into their bath. Um, lots of different ways that herbs can be supportive for people. Um, the aromatherapy of herbs is really nice for people who are in the hospital or undergoing a lot of treatment, making a spritzer that smells lovely with um, essential oils, uh, lots of different scents to choose from, and that can be either calming or uplifting, depending on the scent. And it's a way of using herbal medicine for cancer that isn't directly addressing the tumor or the cancer itself, but that is offering a supportive, holistic environment for this person to uh, integrate their knowledge of what's going on with their feelings of um, either anxiety or stress or panic and helping them move through that process. Great. Thank you. I hope that was uh, helpful to our listeners. And, and the other question that I had, you know, and I'm thinking about what are some common ailments that people struggle with where herbs can help, um, and that maybe that they could use right there in their kitchen is also people who struggle with insomnia and sleep disorders. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as we begin to wrap up a little bit, could you leave our listeners with maybe some suggestions on herbal teas that would be good? I know many times people will go to the store and they might find certain teas in the supermarket if they're not making something at home, but what would be the best herbs to look for if they are going to buy it in a supermarket um, in a tea or if they're looking to make their own herbal tea to help with sleep? 
Okay. Yeah. Insomnia, very common. Lots of reasons people can't fall asleep or if they get to sleep, then they wake up in the middle of the night and they're up for hours. Um, there are a lot of herbs that are sedative and there are a lot of herbs that are nerving. In other words, supporting the nervous system and helping keep our nerves strong. Um, and so a combination of those can be helpful. If there, there are a lot to choose from actually. Um, on the stronger end is valerian. Valerian root is an easy herb to grow in the garden. So if you're prone to insomnia, you can grow valerian flowers and use either the root or the flower uh, as a, a tea or a tincture. The tea is not the tastiest. So you can um, uh, include other herbs such as spearmint or chamomile with it. Um, but it is a lovely sedative herb. Chamomile, a little bit milder. One that a lot of people don't think about is catnip. And oh. catnip. Yeah, it's a mint. It drives cats crazy, but for people, yeah. <laughs> for people, it's actually sedative. It's very calming, and it's a lovely plant for children who can't get to sleep at night for whatever reason. Um, then there are rose petals. Uh, roses are a lovely uh, herb, uh, lovely medicine. If your insomnia is due to grief or sadness or loss, um, roses can be a really helpful plant for helping you get to sleep and, and overcoming that that emotional trauma. Um, you can make rose petal rice pudding. You can make a rose tea. You can sprinkle rose petals in the bathtub. Um, you can put roses in a little bit of oil and um, simmer them and then strain them out and use that as a massage oil to help you get to sleep, especially if somebody can give you a neck rub. Um, holy basil or tulsi is a great herb that's a nerving tonic and it's very soothing and can be very calming and relaxing before going to bed. So all of those are suggestions for inviting plants into your life and especially inviting them in in creative ways that you might not normally think about. Um, not just taking a tincture from the store, but really making it your own and getting to know the plants and experimenting with creative and tasty ways to use them it makes all the difference. Great. And I have a silly question. You're talking about roses. Now, would you recommend I buy a dozen roses for my house and then when they're getting ready to die, I dry them and can I use those rose petals or do you have to be really specific with where you're getting your rose petals from? That's a good question. So there are a lot of different types of roses. Um, wild roses are the best if in the summer you have, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have access to the wild roses growing near you, definitely pick those. If you don't and you want to buy um, roses as a bouquet, just make sure that they haven't been sprayed. If you can check with your florist, if they get their roses from somewhere that uses a lot of chemicals, you don't want that. That would negate the whole purpose. Um, right. And if you can't find them like that, then order from your health food store a bag of red rose petals, organic, and um, then you can use them that way either in your bath or in your food, and you'll know that you're not uh, ingesting any poisons unnecessarily and you're getting some really high-quality rose petals. Great. Thanks, Holly. And um, can you tell our listeners about um, your school of herbal medicine in case people would like to sign up for this and how it works? Definitely. So I run a wonderful little herb school. I live on Martha's Vineyard, which is an island just south of Cape Cod in Boston. And it's called the Bella Bono School of Herbal Medicine. I have a distance program. I have a lot of uh, students all over the world who sign up for the program and they do it on their own time and their own, um, in their own home. But I'm, I'm most well known, I think for the two week herbal intensive, which is an immersion program that happens every summer here on the Island. And it's a beautiful resort Island. It's a lovely place to be in the summer. And we really go in depth. We become a community, um, we go into not only herbal medicine and herbal formulary, how to harvest, how to run an apothecary, how to craft plants into lots of different fun remedies, but also the anatomy and physiology, how to use actions to create remedies and formulas. We even go into entrepreneurship and running your own business, and we go into jurisprudence and the legality of what you're allowed to do as an herbalist. So um, we really have a whole a holistic um view of, uh, you know, teaching about herbs and plants. And it's for everyone from an herbalist and a garden enthusiast all the way up to he uh, healing arts practitioners. I have a lot of midwives, nurses, um, uh, pharmacists have taken the program. 
um, people who want to integrate herbs into their practice, as well as people who want to be a community herbalist. And that's what it results in is a certificate as a community herbalist so that you can move forward in that direction. Wow. Great. And for that two week intensive, do you supply the housing or are people responsible to find their own place to stay for the two weeks? Um, We do have housing available. It's uh, in addition to the tuition and it's a lovely place. I call it the herbal uh, headquarters house and we can all live there and that's where our workshops take place. And it's a lovely spot on the island to relax and renew and restore and have a really great educational experience. And uh, you can learn more about it at hollybellabono.com. Great. Yeah. And this podcast will come out before your next two week intensive, which is June 14th to June 27th of 2018. Um, so if anybody's interested and you still have openings. Yes. Yep. Yeah, Great. Up. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Well, wow. I got so many personal questions answered. Thank you so much. <laughs> this was so fun for me. Okay. Um, I, I really loved the book. I was glad that it came across. Um, and I was like, yes, I want to speak to her. I have questions <laughs> because I'm on this journey. I'm just starting it. So thank, thank you. you. You're a wealth of knowledge. Um, your website also looks great. There's a lot of um, great information on there with your books, your CDs, your webinars. Um, so I would definitely encourage uh, somebody that is interested interested like myself to really check out the stuff that you have there. Great. Thank you so much, April. I really appreciate it. If you want more information about our films, visit our website, path11productions.com to purchase DVDs or to rent and stream each film. You can also find our trilogy of films on iTunes, Amazon Prime, and Gaia.com. You can still use our smartphone app for both Android and iPhones. Just search for Path 11 in the Google Play App Store, or if on an iPhone, look for Path 11 in the iOS App Store. Catch you next time.